Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm here today with Robert Wise, who served from 1965 through 1974 from the 83rd Legislative District from Lycoming County. I appreciate you taking the time to be here with me today. Looking forward to it. Thank you. I wanted to begin by asking you about your childhood and your early family life and how you feel that prepares you for public service. Okay. Uh, I kind of come from a political background as far as my family goes. Uh, how much time do we have? <laughs> my my great-grandfather on my mother's side uh, was a member of Select Council on Williamsport. He was a, m a member of the legislature here, and he uh, was a delegate to the to the Republican convention that elected uh, Abraham that nominated Abraham Lincoln for president. My grandfather on my father's side was an ardent prohibitionist, and he ran for sheriff in Lycoming County. He was a police chief when uh, during the term of our only prohibitionist mayor, was an editor of a newspaper and so forth. My dad was active in politics. He was Democratic registered and recorder and county commissioner for four terms. So uh, that, together with the fact that I went to law school and uh, was uh, first assistant DA, through my family and, and my, my public activities, the voters definitely knew who I was. They either liked me or didn't like me, but they knew who I was. <laughs> well, what influences do you think shaped you to become a Democrat? Well, I suppose uh, the fact my mother and dad were was maybe 90% of the reason I'm a Democrat. But, but the other 10% is important, too, because I'm, I'm a very solid Democrat. I admired FDR. He was my president when I was a kid growing up, and I admired J JFK. And uh, I've never been sorry that I, although my wife was a Republican when I married her, I took her to a dinner for Judge Williams, who was, a, who was running for, for, statewide, for governor on a statewide basis. Lincoln Club had a dinner. I took her to it. She assumed I was, I was a Republican and was going to be a Republican. So it was quite a shock when she found out that wasn't the case. So did, so did she change parties, or is she still a Republican? I, I, I actually dragged her down to the courthouse, and I said, Peggy, I said, all these gals are working hard for me. I said, you cannot remain a registered Republican. A, with bitter protest, she changed her registration, and she's never letting me forget it, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> but she's still a Democrat. <laughs> well, but I know how she votes. <laughs> Unfortunately, what? we cancel each other out. <laughs> well, what kind of Democrat would you say you were or are? Well, I'm basically a conservative Democrat. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm a fiscal conservative, but I believe in most of the social programs that the party stands for. Mm-hmm. Could you just elaborate a little bit more about your education and your um, career before coming to the House? Okay. Uh, when I, jo I joined the Navy on graduation from high school, and, they, they, and I got in the officer's uh, training program, and they sent me to Notre Dame and then to Caltech. When I graduated in 46, that was 43, when I graduated in 46, the war was over in, the, uh, in Europe and practically over in the Pacific. So they said, you can, and I studied meteorology, weather forecasting. So they said, look, you can either fly hurricanes in the Caribbean or you can get out. And I decided uh, in my senior year at Caltech that I wanted to be, go to law school. So I opted to get out, and then I went to Dickinson Law School uh, in uh, 46 to 48, graduated, and then became a lawyer in 19, or 1950. Mm -hmm. Was admitted to the bar in 1950. Okay, and then you became... The assistant district attorney? Yeah. Uh, a friend of mine ran for DA in, in 55, and he was elected. He began 56. He appointed me and another lawyer, uh, first and second assistant DAs in Lycoming County. Mm -hmm. Great. That kept me busy for four years. <laughs> <laughs> well, how did you become interested in law? You know, it, it's, it's hard to uh, put a, a finger on that, although my, my parents saved a like a graduation program from junior high school, that would be ninth grade, which listed all the kids and what they wanted to be, and after me was lawyer. So, and I did not remember that. I really didn't decide until my roommate at Caltech and I both decided we wanted to study law. And he did, and I did. So do you think your background in law helped you with your service in the House? There is no question about it. Uh, not that non-lawyers can't be terrific legislators, because many of them are, but the training we have in the law enables you to uh, understand a bill, first of all, 
and the legal issues, and you know in general what the law is and what you want to change or don't want to change. So it's, it's a tremendous advantage, I think. Well, I want to get to your services, um, legislative service director before um, the legislative um, reference, bureau. reference bureau. Thank you. <laughs> so do you think you always had political aspirations? Or when, did the, when do you think you first got that bug? I think uh, that kind of uh, went along with, uh, of course, my dad was active in politics, so as his son I was interested. But the bug really bit me when JFK was elected president. There's, there's just no question about that, 1960. Okay. So what, what, what happened? Well, I admired him so, and he really challenged the young people of this country to take an active part in politics, and I wanted to take him up on it. <laughs> okay. So how did you personally become involved in politics? You talked about your family's involvement, but you personally, how did you get involved? Well, uh, I told you of my interest in uh, Kennedy. And so I, I first decided to run in uh, 1962. Uh, uh, that was really a, the toughest campaign I ever had. Because as you know, the county is strong Strong, strongly Republican county. And uh, the worst part of that campaign was I decided to run and uh, I made uh, conservation and cleaning up the Susquehanna River my, my prime uh, issue as far as the campaign was going. I actually was able to get Dr. Goddard, Secretary of Environmental Resources, I was probably called something different then, to come up and uh, basically endorse me based on the campaign I've been running, which didn't make his Republican friends very happy in Lacombe County. <laughs> but uh, uh, at any rate, uh, I lost that election in 1962 by uh, about 1,000 votes. Now the county, uh, the, the problem then, however, wasn't so much the, the registration. The problem was that uh, Bill Scranton was the head of the Republican ticket, very popular. Dick Dilworth, the mayor of Philadelphia, was a, the head of the Democratic ticket. And you remember the sh Keystone Shortway was a big issue in those days? Senator Confer from, uh, well, you'd be too young to remember that. Senator Confer from uh, Lycoming County was the principal uh, sponsor and uh, 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 energy behind that Keystone Shortway, which came within 15 miles of Waynesport. And uh, Dick Dilworth said, uh, because he, he represented Philadelphia and was concerned about the business that the short way across the northern part of Pennsylvania would take away from the turnpike across the southern part. So he said, uh, nobody but the bears and the crows will use the Keystone short way. So during that election, they said, uh, you know what Dick Dilworth said about uh, Lycoming County voters, nobody but the bears, and, uh, about the Keystone short way. Nobody but the bears and the crows will use it. That went over like a ton of bricks, as you can imagine. And of course, the other, the other Republican strategy was to depict anybody not from Philadelphia as a, as a puppet of the Philadelphia political machine. So they run ads of Bob Wise as a puppet at the end of a string. Dick Dilworth would be working the string, and uh, you know what Philadelphia has in mind for us bears and crows. It really was an interesting campaign. I only lost it by 1,000 votes. Uh, while well, Scranton was carrying the whole county by 15,000 votes. But that was my toughest election mm -hmm. and my first election. So you entered it back into the race two years later. Well, that's, that's a different story. I okay. had no intention to run it again after that. Uh, at least at that time, I didn't. But the Republicans nominated Barry Goldwater as their presidential candidate, and the local Democrats sensed that this was a great opportunity because I had run so well the two years before. So they, so they, they talked the fellow who had been nominated as our Democratic uh, candidate into resigning. And uh, I said that I would then, the Democratic committee then named me as a, as a replacement candidate. And of course, uh, in that election, that was a Demo as, as big a Democratic sweep as it had been a Republican sweep two years before. So I won over 2,500 votes in my district in 64. So timing uh, my was first term. So timing was everything. Timing is everything, believe me. <laughs> and it, and it matters who, who's heading up the uh, these other tickets. That, that makes a difference. It does make a difference. Did you experience that at, at all again no, or No. Every uh, every election that was every election after that for me was relatively easy. Some were big margins, 
I think 4,000 was my biggest margin, and some were smaller, but uh, that was my only tough campaign. I'm thinking of today's standards, you know, the, every, every election you had competition, though. Every <laughs> election I had competition. Oh, this was a Republican seat. I mean, the congressman turned his staff loose to work for my opponent. <laughs> they really, really went after me, but uh, I had a lot of public support. Well, that's, that helped. That's good. Um, did you like to campaign? Was that something you enjoyed? I liked enjoyed? the campaign. Uh, I have to admit that after three or four campaigns, it began to, 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 to drag on me. But I, 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 I primarily went door to door in the Republican districts because I, I knew I had to get those votes if I had a chance to get elected. So I went door to door in the Republican districts. And my opponent for two campaigns, Jamie Humes, he would go door to door in the Democratic districts and we would pass each other like two ships in the night. It really was funny. But uh, I loved campaigning. We had coffee clatches, and I did all my own advertising, and that was fun to do. All we had was newspaper and radio and brochures to hand out. We didn't have any television advertising at that time, so the expense was totally different. I never spent more than or even close to $5,000 in any of my election campaigns. <coughs> and uh, in a recent campaign, when our present representative was elected, Representative Capelli, the de on the Democrat, it was an open seat because uh, the previous uh, uh, candidate had, uh, assemblyman had retired. The Democrats, federal, state, and local, spent close to 400000 and so did, the de so did the Republican. Close to 400000 on that campaign. I, can you see the difference? A lot of that was TV advertising. A lot of it was mailing of brochures and personal letters and that sort of thing, but that's all expensive. So that, uh, wow. that's... Uh, <laughs> It's a different animal nowadays than it was when I ran. Mm -hmm. Well, who helped you with your campaigns? Did you have a staff of volunteers? Uh, I, the way I tried to work it was I tried to have uh, a someone uh, who would be a friend or an energetic Democrat active in every voting precinct in the 83rd Legislative District. Now, some of those folks were, were dedicated Democratic committee people. I didn't have to worry about them covering the words for me. And where, I, where, where there was, it was weak or there wasn't any, I would try to get volunteers to help me or I'd work that ward or precinct myself. Mm -hmm. was your I'm sorry, was your family ever involved? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I have my, to know my about wife's wife. parents <laughs> were My wife's parents were died in the old Republicans, and, and her mother went door to door for me in the ward we lived in with a Gar Barry <laughs> Goldwater button on one side and my button on the other side. <laughs> so... They did help me. <laughs> and my wife under protest also helped me. That's a great story. Yeah. <laughs> well, could you describe your district, as you recall? Yeah. Uh, my district was, when I first ran, was made up of the city of Lanesport and the township of Loyal Sock. Okay. Uh, it had about, uh, the voter registration on the Republican side was about 13.5, and on the Democratic side was about 9,000. So it was about $4,500. Mm -hmm. 4,500 uh, voter difference in registration. While I was in Harrisburg, the borough of South Waynesport and of Du Bois Town, borough of Du Bois Town was added, and the townships of uh, Armstrong and Susquehanna were added. After I left the legislature, three more strong Republican voting <laughs> <laughs> precincts were added, Hebron Township, Old Lycoming Township, and Lycoming Township. So now, the district is about 17-5 Republican and about 13-5 Democratic, about 4,000 different. So that reg registration-wise, it really hasn't changed a whole lot as far as the uh, Republican edge. It's really mm -hmm. real close to the same. Well, what were the people's issues? What, did they have anything that they really wanted to see accomplished? As I think back, uh, I can't think of any, I mean, Local folks in rural Pennsylvania are very much against taxes. I mean, they, they, they want to hold the line on taxes. So you can assume that going in. And I tried to do that, although I did vote for taxes when we had to do it. But that's, that's the one thing. Uh, the, the issues that were important to those folks were pretty much, I think, driven by, by, by federal and state issues more than local issues. I can't recall any compelling uh, issues at the local level, except as I said in my first campaign, I made clean streams at uh, the centerpiece of my campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, our, our river was badly polluted with mine acid drainage and municipal sewage. 
And uh, it's a gorgeous river. It flows right by Harrisburg here, and a lot's been done to clean it up since then. Well, we talked about your first election and you being elected to the House. What was um, it like coming to Harrisburg? What What was the political scene like here? It, it was. Uh, it was. I have to say, it was a thrill for me. <laughs> the first day that we met in the Democratic uh, major in the major majority caucus room, which was Democrat in '65. Uh, we all, all the new members were, were there. I don't think the, I think it were only the new ele newly elected members. I don't think the uh, returning uh, legislators were there on the Democratic side. But I remember uh, that the Josh Alberg, our uh, Democratic leader, uh, said there's someone I want you to meet. And he brings in the Philadelphia Democratic chairman, Frank Smith, who gave us a pep talk. The gist of which was to vote with our leadership. That would keep us out of trouble and would make a strong party. Uh, I felt very uncomfortable with that notion. I turned around. Behind me was a tall, lanky guy who looked about as unhappy as I was, who later turned out to be Kent Shellhammer. And uh, Kent and I eventually became roommates, and we roomed together almost t the 10 years that we both served in the state legislature. So that's how we. That's how I got started. But I was thrilled to come to Harrisburg. So, <clears throat> during your first swearing-in ceremony, do you recall how you felt during that? Yeah, I was. I was absolutely uh, thrilled to death. It, it's so beautiful. Everybody, you know, gets a Bible. Everybody gets flowers on their desk, and it really was. It really was exciting. And Peggy and my and my three children were there, and it was an exciting time. Do you recall who you sat beside? Uh, on no, the House floor. I, I, I cannot remember who that was. Okay. Um, was there anything that you felt surprised you whenever you first came to Harrisburg? Well, I had no idea what I was getting into, so just about everything surprised me. But uh, one of the things that surprised me and kind of shocked me was the lack of facilities we had at that time. I mean, I had a desk on the floor of the house. There was a phone back in the rear of the house. I had a locker small locker behind the house to hang my coat and hat in. And we had access to a secretarial pool. But that was it. So no office? No, oh, no office, absolutely not. Did you have an office after? Oh, yeah. that's uh, uh, Herb Feynman was a big, big factor, and I think, uh, improving the, the, the facilities of all the legislators. And uh, by the time uh, I served my fifth and last term, I had my own office, I had uh, my own staff, I had my own secretary, and they were beautiful offices. And that was true whether we were in the majority or minority, and it went back and forth in the, f the five terms I was down here. But both sides had, had excellent facilities, well, big do, difference. Well, do you think the lack of facilities whenever you first started impacted your performance at all? I think it, I think it did. I think it made it much, it much more difficult to be effective, no question about it. Well, what were your your thoughts whenever you, as you sat there as a, an elected official, and, and you started watching the process? Because different people have made comments about how chaotic it sometimes looks on, <laughs> from, a, from an outsider's it viewpoint. It often does look chaotic from a from visitor's point of view. Yeah. But I, I loved it because uh, the floor debate was often serious, and many times it was very humorous. Uh, these men and women, most of them had great senses of humor. I remember one time a couple of the, guys, a couple of the fellows from uh, Pennsylvania Dutch areas like Lancaster and Lehigh County or Berks County would get up in that debate using the Pennsylvania Dutch lingo. I mean, there really were a lot of fun uh, times, although we were, we were trying to do serious business. And then some guy <laughs> introduced a bill to name, I don't know if it was a greyhound or what it was, the Pennsylvania State dog. And of course, it went, they never should have reported that out of committee, but it got on the floor of the house and all the guys started to bark. <laughs> <laughs> and the, case, the, the place just, uh, of course, became chaotic. Everybody laughed. and There were a lot, a lot of humorous times, and we had a lot of, I was not one of them, unfortunately, but we had a lot of fellows with great senses of humor and interesting stories to tell, and we always enjoyed those. They would, they would tell a story that would be apropos to the bill or issue we were talking about, and that really made it good. Is there any one person that you think was better than another? Uh, well, 
I don't know what you mean by better, but on but but on the de on the Democratic side, of course, Herb Feynman, Leroy Leroy, Leroy Irvis were the, I think, the two most effective legislators, leaders at least. Mm -hmm. And Marty Mullen, who was the chairman of the Appropriations Committee for years and a very good friend of mine, was also very effective. Mm -hmm. He was carrying the uh, the fight uh, for the Catholic Church. I mean, he was an unabashed, unashamed Catholic, and he was fighting abortion or anything. It, smelled of abortion and he, he led the fight for um, aid to Catholic schools and private schools and he was a very effective legislator. On the, on the Republican side, uh, Bob Butera on the, on the uh, Republican side, Kenny Lee obviously, the speaker. I think one of the things that, infl that surprised me the mo most was how much talent there was in the floor of the House. Really, and it's even better today. I was watching the debate, uh, partly because I was coming down here, it got me thinking about these things. And I was interested in what would happen with the budget, and so I watched the debate the last uh, few days. And I was impressed how good these guys are and, and women are. I mean, they are excellent. They have the facts, they can deliver the arguments, and they're very persuasive, very sincere. And uh, I was really impressed. I think if the folks of Pennsylvania give Congress and probably the legislature low grades. But if they would watch something like that, I think they would come away impressed. Well, I was when I, when I served here. Good. Do you think you had any mentors whenever you first came? Uh, the closest thing that I had to a mentor was Dean Fisher. Governor Lawrence had appointed him as a member of the Pennsylvania Liquor, Liquor Control Board. And the, Dean had to come to me, he was one of the people that came to me and suggested I run. In, uh, it would have been in uh, 62. And uh, when I was finally elected in 64, uh, he interceded, I think, with Herb Feynman for me because I got a plum assignment on the uh, state government committee, which a freshman legislature, legislator normally would not get. And I got game and fisheries, which was a great assignment for somebody from Lycoming County. So to that extent, uh, you might call Dean a mentor. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the questions we ask is about camaraderie, and you talked about sharing a, a, a room with um, Kent Shellhammer. Right, right. What, what kind of other activities other than rooming with a person would produce um, maybe well, camaraderie? Or uh, uh, let, me, let me put it this way. Uh, shortly after we got here, we had a group of 10 or 12 uh, so-called rural legislators. Now, I come from Pennsylvania, from Williamsport. That's not rural but Lycoming County's rule, from central Pennsylvania, that, uh, we w uh, that, that would get together about an hour before the Democratic caucus. And we would have our own caucus, go over the calendar, discuss uh, the issues we had a problem with. And I think as a result of that, we did this every Monday, an hour before the Democratic caucus. I think that we were better prepared to deal with the issues on the floor and we and, and and we'd thought about how we we're going to vote on those issues. I think we had to be better prepared than a lot of the folks were, who maybe took their their lead from just from the leadership. So that that was important. After the session on a Monday or Tuesday night, uh, three or four of us or five of us would have dinner together. I mean, we lived too far away to go home, so we'd eat. And we'd we'd go out and eat, and we'd talk about what happened and what we were going to do the next day, and that was relaxing and and. Uh, we got to be real good friends as a result of that uh, mm -hmm. social time together. Well, the first group you talked about was that the Mushroom Club. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> I think one of the I think one of the reporters <laughs> named it that, but uh, that's that's what that was our handle. Yes, I think um, Mr. Shellhammer referred to that, and Mr. Fittinger <laughs> referred to that. So that must be the group that you're talking about. That's the group I'm talking about. <laughs> So it prepared you, and um, did you guys um, unite behind issues that were common to your area? To the then? extent, that, to the extent that they were right for our, er our area, we did because as a voting, vo the voting block, we could be much more effective. Mm -hmm. But uh, there were many times we did not vote together. <laughs> but that that gave us. Uh, I think it irritated the leadership at times, but it did give us uh, a little bit more uh, wallop on the on the f in voting on the floor of the house. Mm -hmm. Well, you talked about being away from home. Did that present some problems for you? or? Well, I think for me and everybody, because uh, especially if you had kids, because 
And my wife uh, reminds me every day and then how our kids grew up without a father. It wasn't that bad, <laughs> but I was away half of each week when the legislature was in session, and she had, the, had to carry the whole ball. Mm -hmm. So that, that's a factor. Mm -hmm. You talked a little bit about um, the committees that you were assigned to. Did you have a favorite committee? Uh, I suppose I did, uh, and that would be the Education Committee. Uh, on my second term, Herb appointed me to the Education Committee. And I became the uh, chairman of the Higher Education Subcommittee, dealing with the colleges, community colleges, state-related colleges, and the private colleges that we, that we did support, and there were a few like that. Uh, and that, uh, I worked hard at that assignment for the last four terms that I was down here, and that, would, that, was my, that definitely was my favorite assignment, mm -hmm. no question about it. Did any particular legislation that was of interest to you come through oh, the committees? Oh yes, yep, lots. The, the bills that I, that I can think of would be the bill to unify and strengthen our state colleges. They were colleges and not universities, except for maybe Indiana. Uh, the so-called state college bill, to give them, before that, uh, these schools had their own local boards of trustees, oftentimes appointed by the uh, recommended for appointment by the local county chairman. And uh, so they were somewhat political. And uh, their finances were really controlled in Harrisburg. And uh, uh, we wanted to give these institutions a chance to grow. There had been a master plan of Pennsylvania developed, I think even before I got here. And uh, that master plan had recommended that uh, we uh, get these state universities autonomy and uh, independence so that they could grow as, as you would want a state institution to grow. They had been uh, state uh, normal and, and then state teachers' colleges, but they were all branching out, and that's what we wanted. But at any rate, uh, that bill had been uh, uh, held up in the Senate by Preston Davis, who was a senator from just below me in, in uh, Northumberland County. He was very much opposed to that concept. And we would pass the bill in the House, and he would hold it up and get it defeated in the Senate. Wouldn't even get out on the floor of the Senate. Finally, uh, in 1967, uh, I was the floor leader on that bill. We got it passed, and we got it through the Senate. So that was, uh, in my mind, a major accomplishment. We also, and this was also part of the Master Plan for Education, we also wanted to strengthen the State Board of Education. And uh, so that, that was my next assignment. <laughs> And we got that we got that bill passed, in, in the, I think, in the sixty nine seventy session. And uh, the State Board of Education, uh, which you're probably familiar with, uh, coordinates the growth of uh, the, uh, the the state universities, state colleges at that point, uh, all the community colleges. Uh, they have input with the state related colleges, and uh, so that uh, and and vocational schools. Mm -hmm. That was very important. We wanted the state board to have more autonomy, and uh, we, we, uh, we were successful in that. And I was the floor manager in the House on both of those important bills. And uh, pro pro maybe as a result of that, I got appointed to the, uh, to, uh, in those days, I don't think this is true anymore, it might be, in those days, uh, the House and the Senate had represent representation on the FIA board, the Pennsylvania Higher Assistance Agency board. So I was appointed to represent the Democratic House and uh, I don't know, 71 maybe. And then later, I was appointed as, as a Democratic House representative on the State Board of Education, not as a member, but as a delegate, as a, as a listener, somebody with input. And then uh, eventually, uh, when my term was up in 74, I got appointed by Governor Schaap to the State Board of Education in 75, and a couple of years later, I got appointed chairman of the, of the Council of Higher Education. So that was a very, very satisfactory a bit of service. I won't tell you why I'm no longer a member of that, unless you want to know. <laughs> of, course I, like to know. of course I want well, to know. Well, <laughs> in my fifth year, uh, I think it was Governor Thornburg had been elected a governor, and he and appointed the gentleman the Secretary of Education. I'm trying to remember where he was from. I can't remember accurately even his name. But he let it be known that up to that point, the State Board had been totally nonpartisan. 
half Republican appointments, half Democratic appointments. He let it be known that henceforth, as terms expired, only Republicans were going to be elected, nominated, or appointed to the State Board of Education. I thought that was horrible. Uh, when my good friend from Millersville, uh, who was really the hardest working member of the uh, Council of Higher Education on our State Board that, 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 that there was at that time, when his term came up, he was not reappointed. And I was so frustrated that with that, I sent the governor my resignation. I said, this is crazy. I don't want to serve an organization that's it's going to be that political. And uh, I don't know what the composition of the state board is now. I'm sure it's fine, and that's been corrected. But that, that terminated my service after five years of the State Board of Education. Hmm. I had no idea. Um, well, I appreciate you talking about your, your experience with the you know, field of education. I wanted to talk a little bit more about um, something you mentioned was the, the Clean um, the Streams Acts. Right, right. Um, would you mind talking a well, little bit about the issues? Right, well, uh, we had a Clean Streams uh, Act of, of, of sorts in Pennsylvania. In 1965, there, was an import, uh, there were important amendments to that, which, which I supported. I think John Ladadio was the chief sponsor behind that, but I was I think I was a co-sponsor of that, and, and we all worked hard to get that done. And the purpose of that was to prohibit the drainage of mine acid into our streams and rivers, and that, that was a big step forward. Of course, it, it takes a lot of work to dry up uh, and neutralize those, uh, that mine acid drainage, but that's being done across the state of Pennsylvania, and it's been effective. Mm -hmm. Babs Creek, uh, north of where I live, ran orange for mine acid drainage, not a fish or any aquatic life lived on it. You got by, go by Babs Creek today, it's a beautiful stream full of trout. What a difference. And it's not polluting our Susquehanna River anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the clean streams work. If you were going to name one bill, uh, aside from those educational bills, that I felt was the most important contribution I made, it would be the Susquehanna River Basin Compact. I was just going to ask you about that. Uh, that's something I really believed in. And that was a compact between New York State, Pennsylvania, and, and Maryland. Susquehanna River uh, Basin goes through all three states, primarily Pennsylvania, dumps into the Chesapeake Bay, which is so important. And uh, New York and Maryland had passed it. And uh, the bill uh, got introduced into the Senate. And Dick Confer from Lycoming County, Senator Confer, was the main backer of that. And he got it through the Senate handily. Uh, came over to the House, uh, that was 67, I'm not sure, 68 came over to the House. Orville Snare was chairman of, the, the Republican chairman of the, uh, probably was Conservation and Clean Streams Committee, whatever it was, I can't remember. He reported it out. The GOP leadership was not in favor of this, for what reasons I don't know, but I know that the Farm Bureau was very much against it. Originally, the Grange was against it. They came around later and supported it. Enthusiastically, uh, second class townships were against it. A lot of people were against this because they felt that it was taking uh, sovereignty away from Pennsylvania and sharing it with neighboring states and so forth. And so uh, when that came out of Orville Snares Committee, Kenny Lee, the speaker, recommitted that to the Appropriations Committee, where I think he hoped to bury it. Uh, Al Bush, also from Lycoming County, was the uh, vice chairman of the Appropriations Committee, so Al would be there to, take, to look after it. Uh, he was a very effective legislator and part of the Republican leadership, too. At any rate, uh, hearings were held uh, all through uh, the Susquehanna Basin, which is the central part of Pennsylvania. And uh, a lot of enthusiasm, I think, for this bill was developed. And uh, Herb uh, Feynman asked me to be the uh, to to uh, be the floor leader on this bill in the House. And and uh, so I appeared before the Appropriations Committee to lobby f to get the bill out. <laughs> there was not one vote for that bill in the Appropriations Committee. I mean, it was solid against this bill. That's how much work we had to do. And as I said, popular support for this con uh, concept was building. And 
there had been other compacts like this involving the Delaware River, and they were successful. And uh, Pennsylvania sportsmen were all for this. They said part of the farm community was not, but uh, some of the local governments weren't. But uh, the Republican, as popular support for this bill, the Republican strategy was let's gut the bill. And they did that by reporting the bill out onto the House floor with amendments that would make it impossible for the other states to go along, and maybe even the federal government because they had to approve it too. It really gave, Pencil their amendments really gave Pennsylvania the veto power over this, anything that the, uh, that the commission, Susquehanna Basin Commission, commission would decide to do. This would be totally unacceptable to the other states and probably the feds. So that uh, the fight then was to reverse those amendments that, they had, that, the, that the GOP leadership had put on <laughs> in the Appropriations Committee. And so we, we worked at that. We fought hard, and, and we won that battle. We got the bill reverted to, we got those amendments stripped out and got the bill reverted to its former uh, form, like in June of 68. And then the big battle on the bill came up, and finally it came up uh, in July 1968. And uh, by that time, I think there was enough popular support for this bill that even my, my opponent, Al Bush, voted for the bill. It was like 150 to 50, something like that. It was a, the bill passed a lot by a lopsided margin. And that was really a thrill because that's something that's, that's really going to help our, our part of the state, the Susquehanna River Basin, uh, for, you know, for years and years to come, and the Chesapeake Bay. As we pollute the bay, all that is lost. So is it still in effect? Oh, yes. That's, a, that's always going to be in effect. Great. <laughs> Okay. Well, Pennsylvania thanks you then for that. Well, it was a work. lot more than me, but that, that I had I had the, the privilege of, of being the, the guy on it, so I really enjoyed that. Well, since you brought up um, the process of amendments, how do you feel about that? You know, the ability to either amend it. Oh, you got to have that. Because if, if a bill isn't right, you have to amend it and make it right. Mm -hmm. Or if you want to kill a bill, you can try to amend it to death. I mean, it works. It's, it's, there's pluses and minuses, but you have to have that ability. Okay. Almost every bill is amended one way or another before it finally goes to the governor. Mm -hmm. Well, whenever you first started in Harrisburg, did you have a lot of issues that you felt wholeheartedly about? And do you think your issues changed um, by being here in Harrisburg? Oh, yeah. When I came down here, I was, uh, my, my, my principal issue was, uh, was uh, this clean stream concept, clean up the Susquehanna River because that flowed right by Williamsport. And, uh, and reforms to government, state government. That was a big thing in those days. It still is. <laughs> I was going to say But how uh, I wanted to see some things pass, like the open meeting laws, uh, ethics uh, legislation. Uh, I worked hard on that, and uh, I got uh, Herb appointed me a chairman of the first, first ethics committee in the, in the commission of the House of Representatives. So I was pleased about that. So... Uh, it did change because I got into education, and that was my prime responsibility for the rest of my time in the House after my second term. Well, I'd like to go back, I guess, for a second and talk about the reforms. And Well, how do you feel about the reforms that are going on today? I'm all for it. I mean, absolutely. Uh, open meetings are essential. Uh, disclosure of interest legislation that we passed is essential. You can always make that better. We took the first steps along the, that line, at least, and uh, that that sort of thing gives uh, John Q. Public confidence that they're that the the backroom deals are going to be kept to a minimum. If you forgive the expression, you know, openness is so important. Mm -hmm. And I think I've been impressed with this current legislature. I just think they're doing a heck of a job. I was so thrilled with the appointment of Denny O'Brien because. Watching that guy work in the floor uh, on, in, as speaker in the house is really impressive. He's really doing a job, mm -hmm. and he's obviously nonpartisan. He treats everybody the same, and uh, everybody has their say, no matter how long they go. And I, I, he's very effective. Well, what do you think the hardest issue you ever had to face as a legislator was? Well, uh, I don't know. That's that's hard to say. We had a lot of them, but. Tax votes are always difficult. Nobody wants to vote for higher taxes. 
people on fixed income are always stuck with that kind of situation. And uh, so nobody wants to vote for higher taxes. Obviously, it costs money to run the state, so at times you have to do it. Uh, uh, Governor Schapp had the idea of uh, first of the flat rate income tax. Uh, that was finally passed. Uh, I think that was declared unconstitutional. I came back to the legislature and we finally passed a bill that was that was legal. Uh, I don't think I voted for that. Uh, I, I don't think I did. But uh, I, <laughs> I had visions of, of him calling me into uh, his office and him and the budget secretary talking to me. It's a terrible thing to say, but he's gone now. What he could do for Williamsport if I'd vote for it. <laughs> but uh, I did not vote for it. But uh, tax votes are tough. And one of the tax votes that I did feel good about, Kent Shellhammer may have talked to you about when you talked to him. Uh, in 1972, uh, a Schaap, Governor Schaap had presented a budget with about an 8.5% increase in it, I think. And Kent, Kent my roommate, Kent Schellheimer, was the, was the uh, leader of the idea that that is too much of an increase. We've got to cut that budget. And uh, he was successful in doing that. Uh, we cut that budget to something like 4.5%, which had the effect of saving around $150 plus dollar, million. Dollars. And uh, the Republicans voted solid with us, and the 10 or 12 Democrats uh, that were willing to go <laughs> put their neck on the line did the same thing. And uh, we, got, we accomplished that cut. And then, what you know, Hurricane Agnes came along, and every penny was used up for flood relief. But in a way, that was good because we didn't have to borrow money to do the flood relief because we had that in the uh, kitty. Well, you, you mentioned the budget. Well, how do you feel about the budget process? It's tough. I never got to a summer vacation with my family on time, and all the time I was, I was here. It finally got to the point. We like, used to go take the kids down to Cape May in New Jersey. It finally got to the time that the only time I would schedule a vacation would be the week of Labor Day, the end of August, because I knew if I scheduled in July or early August, I wasn't going to be there. And uh, it was typical in those days of going, th uh, of, of going through into July and August. And just things haven't changed, have they? <laughs> well, we're trying, I think. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you, what do you think the major changes were in the legislature during your terms here? You mean facility-wise? It could be whatever you think, the facilities, the building. Um. Well, we talked about, uh, mainly due to Herb's initiative, I think, how the great facility, better facilities were developed for all the legislators. And not only great facilities and offices and staff if you needed them, but the, even a car allowance. I mean, I had to run down here from Waynesport at least once a week, sometimes two or three times a week. And that car allowance really, really helped. Uh, when I came down here, uh, I think, I think the salary was $6,000 with a $3,000 expense account. When I left, it was fifteen six. Now, that's not a fortune by today's standards, but it was a, a good increase. Mm -hmm. And, of course, we know the salaries today are much more than that, and they should be. These guys work hard. Now, you were a part-time legislature. I was a part-time legislator. I worked here Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, except for budget time when we were down the whole week. I would generally get back by Wednesday night. I'd be in my law office Thursday, Friday, and Saturday morning. And Monday morning. I wouldn't leave till noon. <laughs> <laughs> so you had two jobs, basically. I had two jobs, right. And no time <laughs> for right, anything else. Right, oh. right. Pretty much. Yeah, that would be tough. And you talked about um, the ethics committee being created, so that would be a, another major. That was something that I felt real good about. That was needed, and uh, I felt, felt great about that. That was, as I remember, equal number of Republicans and Democrats on that House ethics committee. It was strictly nonpartisan. Whenever you look back and you think about your experiences here in the House, do you have a favorite story that you'd like to share? This is the hardest question, I think, for people. I wish I could share some of the funny stories, that, some of the really funny stories that happened. 
but some of them I can't share, and some of them I can't remember <laughs> anymore. <laughs> but I can tell you there were some many, many uh, humorous, uh, humorous times. But I, I, uh, I thought about that before I came down, and I, I couldn't come up with anything. I should have called some of my friends, but I didn't. So the humor probably broke up some of the the seriousness. It really did. The humor broke up some of the some of the tension, some of the antagonism that developed on the floor. Mm -hmm. It was an important part of it. Do you think the House was very partisan at the time you served? Yes, very, very partisan. There's no, no question about that. I, I like to think it's less partisan today. I think people on both sides are making an effort to make it less partisan today because uh, that's the way you get things done. Mm -hmm. You cooperate. Both sides cooperate. Well, how would you like your service as a representative to be remembered? <laughs> I know. <laughs> I doubt if they will be, so I don't know. Uh, I, I have no idea how to answer that question. Whenever you left um, the House, you became the director of the Legislative right, Reference Bureau. I did. Bureau. I did. Could you tell me how that came into <laughs> being? <laughs> yes, I can. Okay. Uh, the Republicans were in control of the of the legislature at that time. And uh, Al Bush, who was my political opponent, but still my good friend, came to me and he said, look, he said, uh, we would like to have you, uh, Director of the Legislative Reference Bureau, if you would take the position, because we want to make sure that whatever we do up there, whatever our guys or our women do up there, doesn't get leaked back to the Democratic leadership. That had happened in the past. And uh, so I, th I had no intention of staying in Harrisburg. But I thought about it. Number one, the challenge of it. Number two, if I may say so, the salary, which was almost twice as much as I made a l as a legislator, which would effect uh, positively on my pension when I would eventually get it. So uh, I decided to do that. But of course, I had to dig up some support. On the, I had all the Republican support I wanted, but I had to dig up some support on the Democratic side, which wasn't too easy because Herb Feynman had his own guy that he wanted to name. Hmm. And uh, I got 10 or 12 Democrats to vote, to vote uh, for me, and so I got, got named. Well, isn't that the Senate was not a problem, but the, the House was a <laughs> well, little bit of a problem. Wasn't that interesting? Yeah. Now, so Mr. Feynman had already identified who he wanted. Oh yeah. <laughs> and and he was causing problems, huh? Well, he he didn't want me. <laughs> really interesting. We we had always worked. I always liked her, a tremendous individual, effective legislator, but I had given her problems, and uh, he had his own guy that he wanted in there. Okay. Well, very interesting then. Um, can you talk a little bit about the responsibilities that goes into the position of uh, director? Uh, yeah. Uh, the, the director has a, has a fine staff of uh, drafting attorneys and research attorneys. Uh, sender representative goes, has an idea for a bill, and they'll, they'll come up to, to our office up there, and uh, we'll meet with one of, one of the uh, lawyers. And we'll spin his idea, and then, and then that lawyer will, he may have the bill, which he drafted, or he got from another state, or he may have an idea. And whatever it is, he'll sit down with one of the attorneys up there, and they'll, they'll draft the legislation that's needed, and uh, then that member will, will introduce it later on. Uh, we also, uh, as director, had to render legal opinions to the House or the Senate. And... Uh, and thirdly, we had to uh, draft uh, resolutions. <laughs> somebody's birthday, somebody's wedding anniversary, uh, some important event in somebody's life back in their com representative or senator's community. Mm -hmm. Regulatory resolutions were an important part of the job, too, which we did, all did that up there. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, and that was pretty much five days a week. I mean, uh, I was down here more when I was director than when I was in the legislature for two years. Mm -hmm. Is the code and bulletin printed? Yes. There as well. Yes. Is yes. That, that yep. would be something. Yep. yep. Okay. Um, well, can you talk a little bit about what you've been up to since you left that position? Since I went back to uh, Williamsport. Yes. Well, I went back to full-time law practice, 
Okay. And I engaged in full-time law practice. I was active in things in my community, of course, but I went back to full-time law practice until just last year. And uh, I retired, closed my office, and retired in, May, in the end of May of 19, 2006. And so now I'm a gentleman of leisure. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> I've got time to tune in PCN and listen to the <laughs> House and Senate if I want to. Very good. Um, my wife says to me, I, I watched it a lot the last week, Peggy said to me, you know you ought to run for the legislature. You're so interested in what's going on down there. Little did she know I couldn't get 100 votes if I would run today. <laughs> <laughs> well, my last question for you would be, what would your advice be for new members as they begin their careers? Well, uh, far be it for me to give anybody any advice along those lines. I think we've got a really talented bunch of people up there in, this, in, in, the, in the Senate and House. But uh, be your own man or woman. Uh, represent your constituents as best you can back home because they're the ones that elect you, they're the ones that sent you down here. Uh, voting the way somebody tells you to vote is not good, it's not helpful. And I think there was a lot of that going on when I first came down here in the legislature. I think I've been so impressed, as I, as I said last week or so, I've been listening to this debate. I've been so impressed by the legislators from Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. When I was here, that was not happening. That was absolutely not happening. They were told how to vote, and they voted that way, uh, especially in Philadelphia. But that is, to, I, I, really be, I, I hear those guys get up the microphone. They, they have the facts. They know what they want to say, and they say it beautifully. And they may be, you know, they may be with the governor, they may be against the governor. And uh, that's really a healthy situation. Mm -hmm. Be your own man. You can't be too far out of step. <laughs> or, of course, if you, you'll cut your throat. You understand what I mean? Because you have to go, if it's your administration, you have to go to the administration if you need help on road projects or what have you, mm -hmm. which I had to do. Uh, and I don't, I don't recall a time when the fact that I kicked over the traces was really held against me. But uh, if you get too far out of line, they're, they're, they're not, they're not going to help you at all. So there's, there's got to be a happy medium there. Well, thank you very much for sharing that little bit of advice. It's, it's, uh, it's been my pleasure. And uh, I appreciate you taking the time to come down and be here with me for this interview. It was great. Thank you. Thank you.